Well, good morning and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Beth Holly with the Arizona Association of Realtors, and we're proud to bring you these free webinars designed exclusively to keep you updated on issues in the industry. Today's presentation will be about an hour long. If you have any questions during the webinar, please write them in the question box and we will be sure to get them answered at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you'd like to change the size of the webcam video, you simply click on the line separating the webcam and the PowerPoint presentation and drag. As always, today's webinar will be recorded and available next week on our website at aaronline.com. Today's two-part webinar will be Knowledge is Power with Trisha Lehan, a realtor serving the Phoenix Scottsdale area and Smile, the IRS is watching with U.S. Attorney and Canadian Legal Advisor, David Altro. Uh, Tricia is a full-time realtor serving the greater Phoenix Scottsdale area. Born and raised in Southeast Colorado, early in her career, Tricia moved to Canada where she lived and worked for 30 years, building a career in sales and marketing management prior to becoming a full-time realtor. She has served Women's Council of Realtors at the local level as president, state president, and governor, and will be serving as national regional vice president in uh, 2017, 2018, and serving the states of Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona for the year of 2018. So welcome, Trisha. Thank you very much, Beth. I'm honored to be here. This is my second series of a three-part series with AAR. So just want to share as much information of working with Canadian buyers and sellers and resources as I can. So my screen is not moving. I just have the original first Facebook on or the first page. Sorry about that. Um, if you just want to tell me when to advance the slides, I'll, I'll take care of it. Okay, I'm ready for the slides. Oh, are you not? There we go. Okay. So I think what's really, really important is us to understand some of the differences between Canadians and U.S. people or international foreign national buyers. Um, and today, since we're concentrating on Canada, I just want to share some information. I would encourage you, if you did not have the opportunity to see uh, the webinar from last week or 10 days ago, I would definitely encourage you because there's lots of information and tidbits on that. So a couple of things I want to, I really want to start off with, I would encourage each and every one of you, if you're wanting to look at doing uh, business with Canadian buyers and sellers to get your CIPS designation. It's um, about another 90 hours of classes. The Southeast Valley Association of Realtors have offered it in the past, but go online and just Google it, CIPS designation. So the Southeast Valley Association of Realtors uh, do have a global alliance group. They've been active for about three to four years, and their next meeting is March 29th. If you do have any interest in that, Beth will have my contact information available. Please email me, and I will make sure you get on the list. And then I'm very excited that the Scottsdale Association of Realtors in, are in the process of forming a global council. Very new. And our next meeting is March 15th. And I'm actually going to be the chair of this group and very excited because I think that we have so much opportunity in the state of Arizona for snowbirds, especially not having any natural disasters. So according to the Canadian Real Estate Association, I did a webinar in 2015, so I thought it would be really interesting to see the price range difference. So in 2015, the average price of a home was $439,144, and it's almost $479,000 now. Something interesting that I wanted to share, most single family homes in Canada have basements. So that's a, a transition and an adjustment for 
our Canadian clients. And what's great on, um, and I'll go over that again, they do have the walk score on all of the information on the CREA website. Um, this will give you a bit of an idea. Prices in Toronto and Vancouver, this might be slightly outdated. It's upwards of a thousand dollars a square foot, up to fifteen hundred. So you can see the average price showing there of four hundred and seventy nine thousand. Um, probably one of the most affordable cities would be Montreal. It's a very affordable city, in, in you know in the price range of upwards of three hundred thousand dollars. So what our prices are here in comparison and that thousand dollars per square foot isn't for a single family home most of the time it's more for a condo townhome property so i talked about it on the last webinar the majority of the population as you can see on the map is in within 100 miles of the U.S. border to Canada. Average age is 42. And of course, the women are the older ones, but I'm sure sassy. So I wanted to share a couple of opportunities to meet Canadians in Arizona. Um, there's the Great Canadian Picnic held every year. And I think they've been holding it for upwards of 60 years. So in 2019, the date is February the 2nd. And then the Canadian Snowbird Association have an extravaganza. It's already happened this year. Upwards of 4,000 people attend this event. So I went out this year just to check it out and drive through the parking lot and it's full of Canadian cars. So there's a couple of dates that you want to might want to mark on your calendar for 2019. So marketing to Canadians, go to Canada, the major cities. I literally have done workshops in all of the major Western cities in Canada, um, advertising, doing mailings. Um, I would, as identified on the last seminar, the, there are about 14 to 15,000 homeowners in Maricopa County in from Canada. The majority of them are from Alberta, probably around 7,800 homeowners um, are from the province of Alberta. And I, if you have interest in pursuing the Canadian market, you can get your title company to provide you a list of homeowners from Canada. You can break it out by province. You cannot email. There are rules and regulations to Canadian homeowners, but you can always do a snail mail. And I would encourage you consistency. You, you can't expect to mail one letter or postcard and expect results from that. And then of course we have social media that you have the opportunity to touch the buyers and sellers. So I think this is very exciting. Uh, between Air Canada and WestJet, they do have 97 flights a week. And, and this is to Sky Harbor and Phoenix Gateway. Just this year, WestJet started doing flights direct to the Phoenix Gateway, and it did not affect their flights to Sky Harbor. They continue to be uh, high in demand. And so we're showing that the warrant, the demand is warranted. And so they continue to add flights. Really exciting news. Just this past, this past February, they started doing direct nonstop flights three days a week. Air Canada did from Montreal, which will continue to the end of May and then start up again in September. So the projection is with direct nonstop flights, upwards of 20,000 new potential buyers a year. So I'm really excited. The Canadian Real Estate Association are actually going to be at our AAR conference as well as David Altro. 
and Elaine Forget with RBC Bank. They're actually going to have participate in an expo and we're going to be doing a workshop. But here's the information for the Canadian Real Estate Association. As I identified, realtor.ca is their website. And if any of you have interest, they have a huge trade show conference in Toronto, May 30th and 31st this coming year called Realtor Quest. And I think upwards of 7,500 to 10,000 attendees. And then in 2019, the Banff Western Connection Conference is at the Fairmont Banff Resort, Banff Springs Resort, which is north of Calgary, Alberta. So that again would be a perfect opportunity to attend that conference, potentially look at having a booth and getting your exposure there. Oh. Why are we going backwards? Okay, so this, I'm just gonna go through these all relatively quickly. The British Columbia Real Estate Association, there's their contact, and I'm not sure if it's on every one of the associations, but most of them you can get access to their realtors, but it's not as if they just give you the full list, you would have to individually uh, message them or email them through the website. So here's the one for British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, the PEI Real Estate Association, the Yukon Real Estate, and believe it or not, there are Canadian homeowners. Like I said earlier, the majority of them are from Alberta, but there are Canadian homeowners from every part of Canada in Arizona. And the Northwest Territories, Yellowknife and Nunavut. Nunavut didn't identify that they actually do have an association, as you can see. It's hugely spread out and very far north. So this is what I had shared before. The Canadian Real Estate Association are actually going to be at AAR, which the dates are March 21st to 23rd. And they actually do have, here. oh, here's the information. We're doing a workshop from 10.30 to 11.30 at the AAR conference, which I think is very exciting. Um, Azim Jessa, who's from Las Vegas, is going to be the moderator, David Altro. And after you hear David today, I'm sure you're going to want to, to obtain as much information. He's an amazing resource. Elaine Forget, uh, Director of Business Development for RBC Bank. We shared that in, Elaine was on the webinar with me 10 days ago. So once again, if you missed that, go to AAR online and watch that. They have the most amazing mortgage program for Canadian homeowners in the US. And they work only with Canadian homeowners. And then I will also be participating in the workshop. Branded at Canada's Arizona, Canada's other winter playground. And then Canada, just within the last year, have started a CREA Global Affiliate Program. It's $95 a year, and the next slide will show you that information. They will be promoting and highlighting it. Here's some of the opportunities you have if you want to become a global affiliate. So there's the link, koreaglobal.ca. Consider joining, and then when they're all here in March for the spring conference, you'll be able to get more information and face-to-face. -face. So now I'll turn it back to Beth, and you can introduce David. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tricia. Um, and I'd like to now welcome David Altro. Mr. Altro is a U.S. attorney, Canadian legal advisor, and foreign legal consultant with Altro LLP. Uh, he's been practicing law for over 35 years and is the author of several books. 
a frequent presenter and special contributor. Mr. Altru is an expert on legal and tax issues in both the U.S. and Canada. So welcome, Mr. Altru. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is David Altro, and I'm a U.S. attorney and a Canadian legal advisor, and I uh, have a PowerPoint presentation, which I'd love to see change now. Okay, owning U.S. property the Canadian way. Okay, we have offices in Canada and in the States, and we have in Arizona and Florida and California and across Canada. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, issues from your perspective. I am a former realtor myself before I went to law school. I understand how hard realtors work and how you can work so hard and uh, weekends and nights, etc., and actually not get that buyer. So when you do, you, do, you earn every dollar you get on your commission, in my opinion. So let's talk about what your buyer is thinking, okay? Uh, your buyer is thinking, loves Cal uh, uh, Arizona, hates the cold winters in Canada, worries about U.S. capital gains taxes, state tax, how to take title, and probate costs. These are things that Canadians are worrying about. What about financing? Where can they get good advice? And this is a problem because even though we have great lawyers in Arizona, often they don't know the cross-border tax issues, so they just give the advice that's good Arizona advice, like maybe an LLC, okay, which is not good advice for Canadians. They're worried that a Canadian lawyer won't know the I, about the IRS and, and Arizona cross-border issues. So that's another problem because they don't know the cross-border. Do accountants know? Uh, so what is best to do? Uh, I know an Arizona lawyer told me it's best to put the title in an LLC, and that's the worst way, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. So this is a bit of an idea of what your Canadian buyer is thinking. Let's talk about now what you're thinking about, okay? You're thinking... Well, the client seems really interested. That's good. Okay. One spouse is concerned about buying real estate in a foreign country. What is she concerned about? How do I answer the questions about taxes, LLCs, trusts, etc.? How can I alleviate their concerns? Consultation. We recommend a consultation with Altro LLP, Canadian U.S. tax experts and cross-border attorneys with offices in Arizona and Canada. We will set up a consultation for your clients, help to smooth out the bumps in order to get them to want to move forward and buy. They don't have to worry about all the things they hear about, all the misinformation, and we demystify the entire process for them. So uh, I have on here this uh, slide, a couple of my books that I've written, and these books uh, can be effective for you with respect to your clients. Uh, owning U.S. Property the Canadian Way, which is a guide for Canadians owning and buying uh, in the U.S. If you want to have a little bit of an edge over your competition, uh, the book will teach you a lot and you'll have a higher level and that'll help you with your relationship with your clients. And of course, we'll be glad to send you some of the books. The other book is Americans Living in Canada. Uh, Smile, the IRS is watching you for Americans uh, living in Canada or with assets in Canada. So let's talk a little bit about what are the different kinds of ownership structures a Canadian might buy, use to own in Arizona. Could buy it in your name alone, could buy tenants in common with another person, could buy joint with rights of survivorship, could add the kids on, uh, or corporations. Now corporations are an interesting thing. In the States we have C-Corps, S-Corps, LLCs, uh, but in Canada we just have Canadian corporations. Uh, and then there is a two-tiered corporate structure. These are all different ways of possibly owning it. Then there's trust. So many different kinds of trust for so many different reasons. U.S. revocable trust have problems for Canadians. Canadian family trust have problems for Canadians. We love the cross-border trust because it is a cross-border trust that's good for both sides of the border, very effective for Canadians buying personal use property. And then there's the cross-border irrevocable trust which is for the very high net and ultra high net worth clients. Okay. Lastly, there's partnerships. We do like partnerships a lot. We use them for rental properties. So if you're a realtor and you have a client buying five or 10 properties uh, or expects to earn up a buy up to that amount or more or, or, or strip shopping centers or apartment buildings, uh, LLPs, uh, excuse me, LPs are very effective, limited partnerships. 
Limited liability partnerships don't work for Canadians and LLLPs also don't work. So there's a lot of things that don't work for Canadians. So let's look at these issues a little bit more in depth. Probate, incapacity, capital gains tax, liability, U.S. estate tax, and protecting the inheritance for your children. So let's talk about uh, a, a scenario about probate. We bought a house in Phoenix for 500000 put the title in my husband's name alone. Everything was fine until he passed away. After that, I couldn't sell the property because the estate was frozen. Probate took over a year and cost thousands of dollars in fees and costs. So what is the uh, solution here? Well, you can do a lot of different things, but the most effective route that we have found is the cross-border trust, a CBT. This avoids local probate in the county when the client passes away. It avoids incapacity issues. God forbid somebody becomes mentally incapacitated who owns the property. It protects the inheritance for your kids in case they have a divorce or creditors after inheriting. It also preserves foreign tax credits on sale or death. It also reduces or defers U.S. estate tax by the QDOT qualification inside. Okay? And the good news is U.S. banks will provide mortgages on cross-border trust. The diagram shows the trust as follows. The trustee is you, the client. And the beneficiary is you, the client. We don't have to have a third-party trustee, a bank, etc., and run up a lot of expenses. It's really maintenance free, no annual expense. Let's look at another issue, incapacity. My parents own a condo together in Arizona. They can't enjoy it anymore since my mom developed dementia. My dad couldn't sell the property because of my mom's condition. So we had to do a costly and time consuming Arizona guardianship procedure. So what's the solution to avoiding this kind of a nightmare situation? Again, the cross-border trust. Because if you put your property in a cross-border trust, there's no probate when you pass away. And again, there's no incapacity or guardianship issues if you become incapacitated. Inside the document, we simply say if you pass away or you're incapacitated, you're deemed to have resigned and you're replaced with whomever you told me to write in the document, such as your spouse or kid. Now let's talk about a different issue, protecting our kids, right? Well, I got three kids and I want to hopefully protect them in case they have any of these kind of problems. So here we are. We are worried about <clears throat> what happens to our kids after we pass away. If my son inherits my $1 million house in Arizona and then his business goes bankrupt, can his creditors seize the house? Also, if his wife divorces him, will she get 50% of the property? Okay. How to avoid these problems and protect your kids? It actually is the same answer, the cross-border trust. Okay, let's talk tax now. You, uh, you, you sell some, uh, a house to some people and then they come back to you and, and now they want to sell it. And let's take a look at a situation. I bought my Arizona property for $250,000 and put it in a corporation following the advice by my friend by the pool. Let's say it was an unlimited liability company. I was a, at five, 15 years later, I sold it for 750. I was ecstatic about the $500,000 gain until I found out about the IRS tax rate and the double taxation. So let's talk about the LLC. If you own it in the LLC and you sell it and you have a capital gain tax at say 21%, the problem is the double taxation problem. The LLC is not recognized as a, as a, a flow through in the Canadian side, and it is a corporation and it's taxed. Whereas on the US side, it's the person who's taxed. So you have a double taxation. So we really have, uh, recommend staying away from the LLC. You also have a Canadian tax problem called the shareholder benefit rule, which is a hypothetical uh, rental value that you have to add to your income, which is pretty crazy. So take my word for it. Corporations, LLCs are not a good way to go. <clears throat> U.S. estate tax. I am buying a condo in Arizona for a million bucks and I have a net uh, estate worth over 15. I'm worried about the U.S. estate tax as the laws keep changing. What should I do to protect myself? So 
let's talk about Trump's U.S. tax reform, which doubled the U.S. estate tax exemption. Okay, it is now uh, one million. Uh, excuse me, eleven million two hundred thousand um, dollars estate uh, tax exemption, which is a lot better than it used to be. Um, what's included is U.S. real estate for Canadians and U.S. shares of stock. So if you have an estate that's over uh, the 11 million 200 thousand, you have a tax problem on the value of your U.S. property. Let's see what we recommend. Before we go into recommendations, let's take a look at our website, which has a U.S. estate tax calculator, and you can all go on there and do that this yourself. Click in the property value, in this case 350 thousand. Click in the worldwide value of the client, five million dollars, and lo and behold, there's no tax at all. Why? because under the worldwide estate, there's an exemption of 11,200,000. Another example, click the, uh, the change to click, please. Okay, so now we're stuck. Then, anyway, I'll tell you, okay, now I have it. $950,000 on the US taxable estate value of the property on date of death and a $15 million estate it ends up with uh, $45,999 of tax. Okay, so to avoid this taxation, we recommend a different kind of a trust called a cross-border irrevocable trust. And this is very effective for Canadians who are worrying about U.S. estate tax because it avoids the U.S. estate tax and also has all the other advantages, i.e. avoidance of probates, capital gains, um, minimization, uh, no, guard, no uh, incapacity issues, and you can protect the kids. Let's talk about rental properties. Uh, some of you may have clients who that want to buy uh, several rental properties. We don't recommend corporations for that. We don't recommend trust. We like a limited partnership structure. Very effective and easy to set up. Uh, and uh, we have limited partnerships in the US. We have limited partnerships in Canada. No double taxation. It, it works very, very effectively. Set up the LP and you, the client, will own the LP as a limited partner and it works very effectively to avoid U.S. estate tax, capital gain tax, minimization, no probate, but also gets you creditor protection. And creditor protection is very important when you have rental properties because you may have clients um, who um, they rent it out and then there's uh, tenants and tenants have parties and parties, they have invitees. There might be a slip and fall and a big lawsuit. So limited partnership will protect your clients as the owners from any kind of uh, lawsuits where they can go against their Canadian assets. So it's very effective for creditor protection. This is a more sophisticated uh, two-tiered limited partnership structure where the properties are worth a lot of money and the clients are very wealthy. So just to come back, yeah. just to come back on the value, on the different kinds of uh, ownership, for uh, personal use, the uh, we don't recommend any of the personal use ways. We actually go over to the trust and recommend cross-border trust or cross-border irrevocable trust to hold your properties. For rental properties, we recommend um, a limited partnership structure or a two-tiered limited partnership structure. <laughs> Last point I want to raise in this uh, seminar is about your clients may be moving to the Arizona. We've had clients uh, who have bought nice big properties in Arizona, sold their businesses back home in Canada, had a big liquidity event, and lo and behold, now they want to um, move to the U.S., move to Arizona full time. So, of course, they need you as the realtor maybe to upgrade their property. They probably need a bank. Uh, and RBC is quite active there, and they're doing seminars on these things. Uh, and um, they also need to be aware of all the different cross-border tax issues. So our other company, uh, MCA Cross-Border Advisors, does handle all of uh, the event, the issues for Canadians moving to the States, Canadian departure tax, U.S. estate tax planning before you move, uh, immigration, we have an immigration, full-time immigration attorney in our, in our firm does gets green cards and uh, EB-5s, et cetera, and also 
um, uh, getting Medicare coverage and wills and trusts and powers of attorney on the U.S. side. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, for our law firm, what do we do? We represent Canadians with U.S. real estate, tax and estate planning for U.S. citizens living in Canada, Canadians moving to the U.S., immigration to the U.S., tax and estate planning for Canadians, corporate reorganizations and estate freezes, American residents moving to Canada, probate and settlement of estates in Canada and Arizona, and our attorneys are licensed on both sides of the border. We have offices in Montreal, Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver, California, Arizona, and Florida. So if you um, go on our website, we do have an external partner portal. And you can order the books, uh, my books. Uh, you can sign up for newsletters, um, blogs, etc. Uh, it could help you enhance your, your cross-border knowledge. And we would love to have you as an external partner. Just to wrap up uh, our process, guys, is um, set up a consultation for your client and we'll do an analysis of their needs, buying a property, selling a property, what are the tax issues, what are the FERPTA issues, um, how to structure it, et cetera, et cetera. At the conclusion of that, most likely we know what uh, they need and we'll give them a uh, fee quote, which is probably a fixed fee, so clients are happy, you're happy, everybody's happy. And then we um, go into our timeline uh, of the recommended uh, plan, and then we implement it to meet the timeline that you need to get that uh, closing done. So uh, we're very quick on our feet because uh, responsiveness is very important. <clears throat> so I want to thank everybody and turn it back over um, to uh, Tricia uh, and um, Beth and uh, look forward to meeting you all uh, next week at uh, the Arizona uh, a state a realtors uh, convention in Glendale. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was incredibly informative. Uh, so I think we've got several questions. Uh, is there time for that? We have time. Okay, great. So, uh, David, your initial consultation fee and analysis cost uh, to set up the CBT and the CBIT. Safer. So, okay. yeah. Well, uh, initial consultations are three hundred ninety-five dollars, mm -hmm. and um, uh, fees uh, depend on uh, what kind of a structure, uh, and they run from five thousand to eight thousand, depending on what kind of a trust it is. Okay. And what we do is we charge the clients in Canadian dollars, which is a thirty percent discount. Very nice. Uh, are there any other questions? Could you please expand on what uh, communication can be conducted via email with clients? Trisha, you said there were legalities in Canada that we there are there, and I'm not exactly sure, but it became effective about four to five years ago that email, unless you have approved communication with potential buyers and sellers, it you could be fined. How they monitor it and everything, Beth, I'm not really sure, but you wouldn't want to position yourself to have a fine. Okay. You could probably Google and get more details on the specific law. Right, okay. exactly. Great. <clears throat> So, David, can we get uh, the info from you again on the fee ranges? Uh, 5000 to 8000 on the trust in Canadian dollars. Okay. Can, you discuss why, okay. can, can you discuss why Canadians are doing 1031s, even though you suggested once that they shouldn't? Well, here's the story. We like 1031s, like kind exchange under Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code, uh, which ha allows uh, a uh, real estate owner to defer 
paying capital gain tax to the IRS upon sale for the amount of accrued gain. Um, the problem is for Canadians who defer that by 1031, they still have to report their worldwide gains or losses to the Canadian tax department. There's no such thing as a like-kind deferment on capital gain tax in Canada. Therefore, the Canadian will pay capital gain tax in Canada while deferring the tax in the U.S. and then paying the tax in the U.S. downstream upon the sale of the second the property and ending up with no foreign credit and double taxation. It's the worst situation. So don't do 1031 for Canadians. Let the Canadian pay the capital gain tax to the IRS and then declare it in Canada and get a full credit in Canada for the tax paid in the U.S. and therefore it wipes out the whole U.S. tax by getting a credit against the Canadian tax. Very important to understand that. So how long does it take to set up a CBIT? So we move very quickly as I mentioned because we often get uh, realtors who refer us clients and there's two weeks to go or four weeks to go or whatever. So we get it done quickly. We can even do it in a week. Great. So there were requests for uh, your information again. So I put that screen back up. Uh, are there any other questions you would like David or Tricia to address? Um, okay, one more. So just for clarification, if you have a current client that you met and started working with while they were vacationing in Arizona, can you continue to email with them to share properties once they cross the border back into Canada? Of course, but that's been authorized by the potential buyer. So let's say you draw a list from the your title company and you look the people up online and try to pull their email address. Unless they report you, I don't know how it would be discovered, but it is not legal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, can I uh, can I say something about that, Trish? Please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, under the Canadian non-solicitation rule, uh, you can't uh, you send out email blast cold calls. To, uh, under the Canadian rules to anybody in Canada. Cannot. Uh, there's absolutely no way of uh, policing that to stuff that's generated out of countries other than Canada. However, that's still the rule. Um, however, uh, that's the only rule. It's not, you know, once you've had a contact with a Canadian, you can, there's nothing, that's, that's not non-solicitation. The Canadian is your potential client, they reached out to you, you reached out to the client by a referral or something, um, and away you go. So it's just, you cannot do a cold call email uh, solicitation to Canadian residents. Oh, that would be so great here, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So David, another question about the CBT. Um, do you have to set that up prior to close of escrow or can it be done afterwards? It can be done before or after. Uh, for sure, it's best to do it before if you uh, your client is looking to buy because if we have to do it after, it's a deed transferring from their individual names to the trust. There's no land transfer tax on that. There's no taxable event, even if it's gone up. I mean, they can even do it two years after. You buy for 500 and it's worth 600, you can still do it. There's an exemption from capital gain tax on the transfer. So you can do it before or after, but for sure, there's an additional cost to transfer it after because it's another deed. Uh, so if they're planning, your clients are planning to buy, we always set it up for the closing, advise the escrow, give the escrow a copy of the trust, make everything uh, run very smoothly. So if you've already set up an LLC, um, can you change to what it's appropriate for them, um, for properties they currently own here? Well, if you uh, if, the, if you set up an LLC but haven't bought, don't use it. If you already, if the, if the question is, the clients already own it in an LLC, can you transfer it to a, a, a cross-border trust? You can, but on the Canadian side, that'll be a disposition, okay? And so if there's a gain, there's a big problem and we don't like tax so we might not recommend it 
if it's in an LLC uh, for 500, that bought with that 500 and now it's worth 700, uh, we can't do it that way. We'd have to do another technique, which is a little different called check the box uh, to have it categorized as a corporation. And then we can avoid a double taxation. But there's always something we got to do if it's in an LLC because it's really the worst way. Okay. Well, can I get closing thoughts from you? Do you have anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to talk about really quick? Um, I would say, I'd have something to say. Okay. Um, I just want to impress upon uh, uh, you all that it's really, really an advantage if you want to deal with Canadians to have some knowledge on the uh, about some of these issues I just raised. Because whether or not your Canadian clients are talking to you about them, it's in their head. They're worrying about it, first of all. Second of all, in Canada, every real estate transaction has a lawyer representing the purchaser. So if your clients say to you, uh, do I need a lawyer? When you say no, inside they're getting anxious because they're spending in a foreign country. Now, I'm not talking about being the real estate lawyer. Uh, I'm talking about doing the tax and estate planning structuring for them. So you're helping them if you are able to say, oh, yes, well, we deal with uh, Altro with cross-border uh, firm. So we're not here to create roadblocks or we're here to smooth out the bumps. And we've been doing this over 35 years. Uh, and uh, I, I really think you got an advantage when you have that extra knowledge and differentiate yourself from your competition. Great. Thank you. Uh, Trisha, any closing thoughts? I hope that everybody will take advantage of coming out to the Arizona Realtor Conference next week. They have registration open until Wednesday, and you'll have the opportunity to be face-to-face -face with David, Elaine, myself, as on the workshop as well as face-to-face -face at the Expo tailgate party, which is Tuesday starting at 4.30 and till two o'clock on Wednesday, so. Yes, and I, if the people want to try to find me at the uh, convention, um, I have been invited by RBC to um, have, uh, to be at the RBC booth. Uh, I'll have a banner there and uh, I'll, I'll be there. So that's where you can find me. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for um, in, coming on with us today. And if anyone had questions they didn't get answered, please, by all means, see us at the convention. And have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you.